Okay. Now we are. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Terry, how we begin these is, first of all, would you tell me about who your parents were and where they came from? Because you know, like for example, your grandparents, your mother's maiden name, and all that kind of stuff. Because, say, in a hundred years' time, when people are looking at this, they they'd be saying, "No, which." Which one was he now? And then they'd be kind of trying to figure out who was he and uh, so they try to figure out who you're related to and all that kind of stuff. So give all the family background for us. Well Yeah, off you go. Well, I tell you, the person known most would be my grandmother, who was called Kate Kyung. And uh, we lived in the arch there, the snow barber shop. And there was four houses in there, there was three facing and one on the side. And uh, my father was from Riverstown, uh, Morrissey, Jimmy Morrissey from Riverstown, a place called The Gap. That's we, he was from there. But all my father's brothers and sisters emigrated to England. That's why I ended up in England, except for one brother, Conk Morrissey, who's quite famous here as well for the soccer club. Oh. And he played with the rookies. So that's my family background. And, and you said they all went to England. What kind of jobs did they do in England? Oh, sure, they were, um, I'd say, labourers mostly uh, in England. Uh, even some of them on the railway as well. But then they all were conscripted, including my father, who was killed in uh, 1943 in Bournemouth, and that's where he's buried. Um, the rest of them went through the whole the whole war, the whole campaign without a scratch. But he never got out of England and he got killed. So, quite amazing, really. And what part of England were you in? Uh, London. Okay. And uh, as I was, he was uh, down the barracks in uh, Bournemouth and it was a daylight raid and they were all killed, except for a particular gentleman whom I met about 30 years later um, who came over on chance on a a visit with his son to Ireland and decided to come to Tremor and happened to meet Andy. Uh, went up to the graveyard, just no idea who he was looking for except Morrissey's and uh, met Andy and Andy sent him down to my aunt who called me so he actually ended up meeting my his best friend who was my father. He met his son and his grandchildren so it was, it was fabulous actually. Yeah, it was really Really great. And this, this is just a bombing raid in Birmingham? Right? A bomb, bombing, yeah. A, a daylight raid on the barracks and or should they, there was nothing left of the place. I think there was over over a hundred uh, men killed in it. There were. And <coughs> you were, were you born in Tremor? No, I was born in, born in England. Okay. And then, what, uh, what's your, I mean, what would be your earliest memory of England then when you were really young? Well, the earliest memories were going to school during the war and uh, the nighttime raids. There lots of those and my mother refused point blank to go down to the shelters. So we stayed in the house uh, under a table, which was going to be a great head of the bomb fell. <laughs> but, uh, but you remember that? Oh, I do well. The under the table. I do well and I remember the, 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 the clanging of the first of the sirens when the, the raids be over and then the clang of the fire engines going on and also the whistling bombs that were overhead and when the whistling stopped the bomb came down so I can remember that and can remember it well and then going to school past all the bombed buildings actually two of the schools I went to were bombed the night after I was there so Hitler became my best friend. <laughs> and what part of London was that? Uh, Shepherd's Bush. Okay. Shepherd's Bush I and lived in. Did you have friends then in school and all that from that area? I had, but I can only vaguely remember. I was quite young at the time. Um, I remember going uh, one particular stage, get, going off, you know, you went off with your gas mask and we had to put it on then at school one day. Because we were sent into the the air raid shelter, I think there was a daily raid or something. Jeez, I couldn't hack the the thing on my face at all because I was asthmatic. Jeez, I, I couldn't hack it at all at all. So I said to myself, in my own mind, 
I'm going to die one way or another now because I can't wear this thing. I just couldn't. But uh, they were my memories, yeah. and uh, and then with, 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 at the time you'd like I was so young I didn't realize what was going on. He didn't kind of flying over my head. Yeah. But I do remember the day my poor mother got the telegram to say that my father was killed. I just remember that well. That sticks in my memory. And it. I think like the present generation wouldn't even know what a telegram would be like. So no, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> so when you get to knock on the door or the, and, and it's yeah, a telegram, I, I, by, you yeah, I remember it, we, we, we were in rented accommodation and the people who who owned the place were uh, Mr. and Mrs. Lawler was their name. And I remember them trying to comfort my mother. And I was standing in the hall and I, I knew there was something wrong, but I couldn't grasp exactly. But my mother was wailing like mad. Jeez, I remember well. Even to this day, it's, I can I can bring shivers down my spine. But uh, and, then, and I still have the telegram. Do I? Hmm. And she was left then with how many children? I was the only one. Oh, you're the only one. Yeah. And then you came back to Tremor, was it? We we came back to Tremor then. That wasn't forty three. Came back to Tremor and I made my communion here in forty four. And we headed off back to England again, because uh, I was there for Armistice Day. And I made my confirmation in England. But then we headed for the States. Over, She had sisters over there, stepsisters and a sister. And I went to school in the States, but she didn't like it. So that was it. She finally came back. Oh. So what age were you when you came back then? Uh, about nine. Okay. Nine. And Joe, you know when you came home for your first communion, do you have any memories of that, what that was like? I do remember, I, I can remember, the, what I remember most about the communion was, not the communion, but in those days, yeah, you went and go off to Joe Shea's or anything like that, you went to the school and they had a, a party in the school for you, and you got your tea and cakes or whatever, but I always remember mine was two Roman butter sweets. I got to. I remember that. That's what stands out for me for the communion. <laughs> Genie back. <laughs> I wasn't fired with religious zeal. I was just happy to get the two sweets. Ah, oh, gee. Uh, and, and did you meet, at that station, did you meet cousins and all that? And all that? Oh, yeah. I, I See, when I went in the arch, I said in the arch, my cousins were living in the arch with me, Matt and Michael and Pearlie. And then my others cousins, they would know, these were my mother's people. I'm mostly involved with my mother's feet, which is kind of sad because all my father's people most of them were in England. So I only know a couple of uh, cousins from England okay. and that would be from my staying in England. Whereas I'd be more involved with my own my mother's side of the family. So. And then <coughs> coming into Tremor then when you were nine, what was that like? Uh, I remember coming up on the boat, coming up the, the river and watching all the greenery and standing on deck and then getting the jaunting cart across, which was very precarious, I can tell you. From my point of view, and it was hanging on for dear life. I don't know how anyone sat on those things. So really you came up the boat into Warford? Yeah. And then you got the jaunting cart? Yeah. So I went across to the station okay. into more. And then you got the train out. And the train out, yeah. That was great. The boats, horses and trains. Yep. Boats, horses, trains. And what was the journey up on the boat like? What was that like? Oh, from England. Well, I, my mother was one, always got seasick. Okay. And we went, when we went to the States, I remember, we went from Southampton on the, the Mauritania. And my mother crossed the gangplank and promptly got seasick and the boat hadn't moved. So I spent over a week running around a huge liner on my own. Because my mother was laid out in the bed until we got to New York. So that must have been an adventure though, was it? It was a huge adventure. I, I met my very first black man in New York. He was in Grand Central Station. And I think, I, and I, to my mind and for it mustn't be I felt as if there was only myself and my mother and that man were in the station 
because I don't remember seeing anybody else. But we got, I remember getting a cup of tea and there was string hanging out of the tea. And I was wondering what that was, so I caught and whipped it out. Of course, it was the tea bag. Never seen a tea bag in my life before. So that sticks very much in my mind. And uh, then we got a taxi across to the train to go down to Boston. And I don't remember anything about the train. But I do remember going across the taxi and seeing the lights in one particular street. I remember we passed, it was just oh, lights everywhere. And whatever street it was, no idea. But it was just lights one end to the other, all different colours. I remember looking that at out through the window of the taxi. It's funny the way things stick in your mind because I don't remember getting on the train or anything. So. And then, uh, Terry, to go back to you, when you, when you arrived in Tremor then at nine years of age, was that difficult to get to know people here and all that kind of stuff? Uh, as a young kid. Well, I, I, I think I was lucky in the sense that I had my cousins here, even though I would have been kind of a, a half a stranger to them, I was still their cousin. So I, I would have been, they would have been bringing me around and I would have been following around like a dog. Even though I would have been older than they were, I'd still be following them. So that I integrated fairly fast. And then, you see, um, Frankie was actually my best pal. He arrived at the same time, so there was two strangers. Even though he was born in Tremor, he used to be always give out to me. You were born in London, yet everyone tells me you're a Tremor man. I was born in Tremor, everybody tells me I'm from Waterford, you know. So we actually integrated, so I integrated fairly fast, I must say. Uh, who was Frankie then, sorry, to you? He's just Frankie Parrish, just down the road there. All oh, right, so he became your best man. Yeah, he was, and has been ever since. That's gas. That's over 70 years ago. And what, I mean, coming from London and America, was Tremor a very small place to you when you arrived? Well, it was. Um, it would have been much different because there was no traffic. There was no cars in Tremor. Um, the only people had car now was a fella called Patsy Nance, which was Patsy Power, and he was the taxi man. And he had a big red Ford V8. And there was a fella then down on Patrick Street, another Power called Mikey Dykey, and he had a, a Model T Ford truck, and he only took it out once a week and drove down Main Street and up Patrick Street and into the garage. And it had an old, oh, 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 this is the, the horn. And every week he did that. That was the only drive it got. Whereas the taxi man would have been, but it was no other other than horses and carts. And my uncle, who was in the arch with me, they moved to the uh, first house in Patrick Street and he had a shed down just in the middle of it down below where the council had offices. He had a, a horse and trap down there. And on a Sunday he'd take us out in the horse and trap, all of us together. And it, we'd have a bag of broken biscuits or something. And away we'd go for a spin out the country. So it was terrific. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> I mean, did you like Tremor when you came? Oh, I did, yeah. I, I did, yeah. And what was your earliest, I mean, what, what do you kind of remember most about the place, besides the traffic and all that? I mean, did you get on, you were in the primary school then, obviously? Yes. Okay, and what was that like in the primary school? Well, the Christian brothers were there. <laughs> we won't go any further. <laughs> and actually, one of them, God be good and merciful to him, oh jeez, he was a devil. He only died the other day, he was a hundred years old. So I thought it was well dead years ago. But um, that was an eye opener for me, I so can they, tell you that. They were very tough. Oh jeez. You got slaughtered. And I mean slaughtered. And uh, okay, I know they taught you. People said that all they did was beat you up. They did teach you, but I'll tell you, from my point of view, I was um, an only child, and according to my mother, I was a very delicate child. So I was molly coddled to the nth degree. And then they put me up into that concentration camp called a school. 
and I'd so, it soon toughened me up. I don't mind telling. I wouldn't have survived if I if if I hadn't toughened up. So didn't do me any harm at all. I actually have very fond memories of it. Even the killings that we got. <coughs> and then, I mean, you'd never done Irish then before you went to school, did you? No, and I, and I, I did all right at it as well, funny right. thing. I was always held up as an example, you see. <laughs> and that just made me worse, because it's just like, that's going to kill me. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this chap has been in England, now he can do it. Irish, you know, jeez, don't say that, please. <laughs> oh, Lord. Set you up. Set me up was right. And then what shops would you have gone to in town when you when you were a child? Well, um, Huey Doherty's shop was straight across the road from the Arch, which is now Brennan's um, Pharmacy. And that was I was over there, over and back every day, a couple of times a day. But... Um, you got your broken biscuits going back, pen and worth broken biscuits going back to school or you bought a cake or I did the messages from my mother and you used to get, uh, I think it was two and a quarter percent off and that was kept until Christmas time and to go towards the Christmas shopping. So it was great and that was really nice man I must say but himself and his wife, I think his wife was with him, killed it coming back from a trip to Lourdes years later yeah sad you we do and what, what about comics where did you get comics from oh the comics was down in um where was the, the shop we used to get just i can't remember where we got the comics, but i always got the comics um and i can't even remember the name of the ones now but uh limp along leslie was one of the ones that was in it i remember that well and um the hotspur was the name of the comic and I used to get the can't remember where they got those now. And the other way, was, did your mother work when she came back? Here? She did. She worked for um, uh, Miss Newport on the Waterford Road, and she worked for uh, people down in Bellevue Terrace, and she worked for the Jacobs. And the Jacobs were, um, I think they were the Quakers. They were Quakers. And they looked after us. They kind of half reared us as well, to be honest. And I always remember the lady, the the the, the Miss Jacob, that was alongside the the Majestic Hotel. It's a big, huge bed and breakfast place now. She used to always give me these lovely story books. But they were, I'd say if the priest found out I had these books, because they were. The, Protestant, what you call it? <laughs> Jeez. But they were be beautifully illustrated and I loved reading. Oh, they were beautiful. So eventually she gave me, I remember, um, she gave me two volumes, one of a history of Greece and one of a history of Rome. And they were gold leafed. One was green cover and one was a red cover. And where I are to this day, I'd say they were valuable now. I don't know. <clears throat> and did you did you get a part time job when you were young? No, my mother wouldn't let her only child, Jesus, her angel, and her delicate angel at that, be left out to work with the rest of the the payons, genie Matt tonight. No. So you were very privileged there. Oh, very, very privileged. Mm. Yes, indeed. And your mum then was she like housekeeping in these places? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so would she be out? Funny hours, like what sort of hours did she do? Uh, my poor mother was a, a funny one. Uh, she never got over my father's death, ever. And uh, she was just a funny woman. She, she was a very funny woman. So the poor old thing, she ended up in St. Otterns, eventually. Because she used to, as I grew older, she, she withdrew altogether from the world and just to sit in a room, the curtains down all day, and go out at night time, maybe two, three, four in the morning, be walking the road, and I, fellas knocking on the door, giving out to me, your mother walking down the middle of the road, you know. But that a woman just was unfortunate. <coughs> and then, where did you go to 
secondary school? Oh, I just left. Oh, you left. Yeah, did you I, get I, a job? Soon? I went into the the tech, and uh, I sure enjoyed myself in there. Uh, what was your first job then? Um, I went to England. I back to England in in fifty nine with the rest of Tremor. Because I remember standing in the cinema outside Shepherd's Bush and there was 30 of us from Tremor oh in the queue. And a few more came in. I remember that well. But um, I hated the place. I hated it. I thought I was going back to a home away from home. I absolutely hated it. And I lasted... I don't even think I lasted a year and I came back and I got a job my cousin was working for a vet and he was going to college so I got his job and I, I stayed in that job for about 50 years in between I still I actually still go in there and uh, I meet I meet his daughter every month we go for lunch so you were working for a vet yeah okay uh, who was the vet? Uh, Jack Cranley. Oh, right. I worked for Jack for years. I I had a other a job in between and into, but I always was with Jack. And when I lost the job, or in the when the what you call it happened, the, the job closed down. I went back to Jack again. So um, as I said, I'm still still going in to meet his daughter. So you would have been going around to a lot of the farms then? Oh there. geez, I know every road, bush, tree in, in, in County Waterford and South Kilkenny. Right. And, and and obviously that was a very interesting time in the sense that I suppose the I suppose people in the countryside would have been very I suppose how do you call it, kind of simple kind of people and Yeah, it it, it, it the um T B testing was in that's what I was involved in, and um, there was no such things as crushes or anything like that. All the animals had to be caught physically, and uh, I learned to do that too. And I was very small and light, but uh, what Jay was for me it was great because I, as a delicate man, I was delicate because I suffered badly from, from chronic asthma. It was great help to me because um, I was out in the open all the time, fresh air, and it toughened me up in a big way, big way. I mean, um, the, even even things like, people would have believed in things like the fairies and all that kind of stuff. Back oh then. yeah, and and uh, the cattle, the, they'd have certain pieces of things on the cattle, they can call Lyrena, fowl of the foot, they'd, they'd have a rope around the animal's neck. This was to, offset that rather than getting the vet, you know, this kind of way. So a lot of that. Mm. And you, when you went to test the cattle in some of the small farms, they'd come out with a bottle of holy water and they'd be, the cattle would be drowned with the holy water to make sure they passed the test. And you as well. Like. But, um, they were great times. Mm. Ireland was great. And it, I suppose it, was, it was innocent. But there'd be great respect for the vet, wouldn't there? Oh gee, should they thought I was a veteran? Yeah. And should I wasn't? Yeah. But uh, and I actually, I don't know whether I should say this or not. I probably don't. But one particular day he was sick, and it was the day we were to go out to check to see whether they had the TB or not. And he sent me out, and I went around to all the farms and I checked the animals, and I found one where it was actually. I knew it was a reactor. But I couldn't say to you, man, that's a reactor. Because I said to myself, I say that. And somebody hears what happens, we're in serious trouble. So I'm, I told you, man, that's very, very close to being a reactor. If I were you, I'd send it into the factory. So I came back and I told the boss that. <laughs> so I said, you better go out and make sure he does that. But no one ever thought any different. Because if you were any way educated at all, they thought you were great. And I, when we'd be reading numbers, the numbers came in sequence. So if somebody read out a number and then couldn't probably read another one, right, if I got half the sequence, I, can, I could tell, you see, what the number was. So I'd say the number. They actually thought, 
that I knew the number was on them and the animal was there. But uh, you see... I, uh, I mean, the vet, you had to pay for the vet. Uh, well, the TB test was done, you see, free. Oh, okay. So there was no no payment there, oh, which is you never, you never got the animals tested. Didn't sure. have the money. When you see them, you see the small farms. When I started out, the small little farms that were there, and now you see the sons. I mean, there was a man that I was there. He, he did, I think he had sixty cattle and sixty cattle that he couldn't feed either. And they were all very poorly. Now his son is over five hundred cattle, well, beautiful animals. You, you know the way the the, the Ireland evolved from having farms with small amount of animals to having huge farms, dairy farms, and everything. It's really just well, it's great, really it is. I must say. And <coughs> you were a townie, like you know, you're into more. But <coughs> would you not have liked to live in the country, or would you? I love the country, but the country to me was is was up here, you see, because I used to walk up the town with the lads from here. This was a huge field. You cl there was a gate up at the top of the field there. You climbed in over the gate in August. This f field, loads of mushrooms here. So that, w that this field was out in the country. Okay. And so, like, a lot of people from town would go head off to the country and go picking... Berries, blackberries. Yeah. That was another thing. You picked blackberries and you got paid. You got money from Huey Doherty. So in order to get to the pitchers, which were twopence at the time, you went out and you picked mushrooms up, or blackberries up the road and you went in and you sold them to Huey. You got the money for the pitchers. Because you went to the pitchers at every change. That was the... Well, which picture house was this? Like? Down there, and, and where is, which is Carl's now. The Rex. Okay. And... You didn't go into the the big seat. You went into the gods. That was the, yeah, that was the cool place to be. Yeah, to be in there. And if you were a millionaire, it didn't make any difference. She went into the gods, so everybody went in every Sunday, and uh, every different change during the week, two pence to get in. And uh, oh, geez, great times. And where did young people? I mean, what do young people do around Chawar at that stage? I mean, were they? I mean, obviously the cinema. What else was there? We, um, you know, we used to play football on the strand day, morning, noon, night, but we also swam over in the pier, and uh, you now we didn't stay so much on the strand. We went to the pier to swim, so we walked over to the pier. It was packed, and some people went out to Newtown Cove, walked out there. Now I, I, I think I swam only once. In Newtown Cove, but the pier was the place to be, and uh, that's where I learned to swim actually. Okay. Was in, in the pier. And so was there any any other any kind of like dances around that that time, or was that? Uh, well, the nuns and the priests, the priests, um, never the twain should meet. Like so, there used to be dances in Tremor House or in what's known as the assembly rooms where the bridge club is now and um, which was the li the library there was dances down there as well but um actually there wouldn't be really dances yeah. and, and what about you know when you got to an age where you were going out maybe to get a drink in a pub or something where which pubs would serve young people at that stage well we i went to uh, the vic that's that's where i went um that was my starting point. Uh, who is it? Who is it? Uh, um, uh, Pauline, oh. Joe's mother, yeah. and, uh, and and the father there. Uh, geez, some great, um, great times, there, especially with the father. Jeez. Oh, geez. oh God. Uh, he, he was from the north, was he? He was, yeah. Mm -hmm. He drank whiskey like there was no tomorrow. <laughs> oh, God almighty. And it was a guest house, wasn't it? It was, yeah. It was guest house. I think your man Brendan Corish used to get, used to stay there. In, the Labour Party. Though. Yeah, the Labour Party leader used to stay there. Oh. But, uh, and we used to stay there as well. <laughs> Unofficially. <laughs> Unofficially. Oh, God. And come here, just about that growing up in Tremor, like, you know, you get an awful lot of visitors here. Yes. Like, would you ever have, like, summer romances and all that kind of stuff going on? Oh, God. Yes. 
the good old days and, what you call it in the mists of time I'm afraid we the, we were very um, friendly with people from Carlo and from a toy and um, the Bradbury's and um, I think they had a big bakery up in in a toy if I'm not mistaken and um, the Reddies um, who have all the pubs personal friends with all of those and um, Oh, there was others. There, there, there were a lot of them horsey people that we, we would have been very friendly with. They came down during the summer. Very friendly with. And uh, going to dances and all that sort of stuff. So the same families would come back every summer? Oh, every summer, yeah. We, we meet them every summer. And would they rent a house or were they in caravans? Or there were no, they were uh, in... in um, a lot of them stayed down with Mrs. O'Connor in um, Queen Street. So that's where we used to meet, and we'd all, we'd all go down. We were down to the the High B, which was the place then. I'd say it was the place in Ireland. I would say, the High B, way back in the sixties. And as a matter of fact, I ended up when I met Mary and and, and was going to get married. I ended up working in the High B, and I was there for fourteen years, which was. Uh, Terrific. As a barman? Yeah, terrific. Oh, geez, we're great. The disco period was starting then, was absolutely fantastic. Really fantastic. So you were a busy man then, working the bar in the evening time then? Oh, geez, barn. We know what time you get home at, and then you'd go to work in the morning. So. Yeah. yeah, oh, geez, the bar was absolutely brilliant. The high V was, it was a mecca, there's no doubt about it. And then he put in the when disco music came out, he put in the the floor like the thing that John Travolta. He put in that thing that Jesus, black Friday night, Saturday night. Oh, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant! I must say. And and just to throw your mind back, I mean, you're the, the way when you were a child, you came to Shmore. Can you remember any of the old characters that were in Shmore at that time? Well, Limerick Bill was uh, one of the my abiding memory of. Poor old Limerick Bill. So who was he? Tell us he, he was um. I think I think he was from Limerick. His photographs him around. We used to wear these black clothes, and he'd have medals, and he'd have the hat with all the medals, and the, every St Patrick's Day badge he had all his life was on the coat, and he used to sit down. He was always complaining about where he was living, and where you think of those houses opposite the the school now, how beautiful they were. And he lived up there and said the roofs were falling in and everything. They were called the poor houses and they were the poor houses. But he lived up there. And there was another fella called, um, I think it was Martin Kent, I think was his name. And he used to go off with this big boat on his head. Go off big, you know, there was big long corrucks. Now it was as light as a feather because one man wouldn't be able to hold it. But he'd go off with that. And he'd, wherever he went, I don't know, down the back stand or whatever. So, there. And speaking of that, did you do fishing yourself? Or, uh, no, 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 no. So you were a soccer player? Well, I was. I played soccer. Would to say I was a soccer player? <laughs> I played it all right. And what other things like here with the races and all that? Were you, you I worked in the race course as well. Um, I was, in those days, you were the course outside which was open then I used to, there was a big number board and I used to put the jockeys names into the number board so they know who was in the rest I have one of them over in the house that kept it and uh, it was a pound a day which was a lot of money to me anyway in those days so the four days of the races or whatever work day it was great most enjoyable you were very enterprising weren't you which you had to be, like, you had to be. Made a fool of myself, you see, I didn't go to school, so I ended up having to, made a mistake, I should have. I had brains, didn't use them. Yeah, because you said you liked to read books. Oh, jeez, I, I I could read books from, I'd say, about five, five years of age. Could well read books. And was it just, like, the school, old school thing, or what? Sorry? 
Well, say in school because it was <coughs> you just well, uh, it? there was one particular fella there. He was the headmaster, Lord of Mercy, on him. He was a bastard. And I mean a bastard. And he had a leather, which didn't hurt you, but he thought it did. And the venom with which he used to pull on you with that leather, thinking he hurt you, but you see he didn't. So you didn't mind. <laughs> Jeez. Uh, yeah, you learned off, you learned your lessons. So you used to follow along. Geraldine, he'd ask her first, he'd care next, you see. So you knew, fifth line, you don't ask a line, so you knew you got the fifth line. So you'd only learn the fifth line. See, he thought he was great. But the trouble is, if the fella in front of you who was reading the fourth line, couldn't read it, you were in trouble then, because you didn't know it. Jeez. Oh, God almighty tonight. Oh, gee. See, enterprise, you learn. You do learn at school. <laughs> you learn to survive. You learn to survive. I, t I, I, I often say that to the people afterwards, you know, because I, I was a really delicate fellow now. I really was. I, I weighed about, when I was 18, I weighed about four stone. I was really, really delicate fellow. So I learned to survive. I did very well at school, like I did all right. Yeah. I wasn't killed. And how did you meet your wife then? My wife worked in in the Department of Agriculture. So the first day I went to work with Jack Cranley, I had to go over to the Department of Agriculture with something. And I have to say, I don't know whether I believe it or not, but love at first sight. End of story. And that was it. So I said to myself, if I'm ever going to get married, I remember it. That's the girl I want to marry. Of course, it took me six years to ask her out. But there. Go ahead. Yeah. And so when you walked in, you saw her, you knew straight away. Yeah. And what did she look like? Tell us what she looked like. Well, I thought she was absolutely beautiful, I have to say. So what colour hair is she? She had a dark hair, dark, dark, dark brown hair. So. And where was she from? She was from a place called College Green. Um, up there in Belly Truckle, that's where she was from. So, as I said, it took me six years to ask her out, but I had a lot of living to do between that and then, you see, because I was 23 at the time, going on 14, so there was just no way. So, uh, what happened then was how I, I came to eventually take her out was. My aunt, my mother's sister, who was 108 when she died on my dad, came home from America after 40 years. Now, I had met her because I'd stayed with her in the States, but none of, none of the rest of my cousins had. And we had the greatest piss up in the history of Ireland while she was home for the month. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, I don't think we ever got home. So after that, I just said to myself, I've had enough, I can't do this anymore. So I think it's time to settle down. <laughs> oh, when I think of it. Oh, God almighty. It was brilliant. Brilliant time. Brilliant time. And, and she was still waiting there to be asked? Well, obviously she was, yeah. Okay. <laughs> so you're keeping I don't know why. I, I don't know what would have happened to somebody else to ask her, even though she told me. Two very well, um, two very well known men had asked her, and men who had plenty, plenty of money. And I said to them, "Why the bloody hell didn't you go with the two of them, <laughs> rather than come with me and nothing?" But there, you are. that's that's well, love she and life. Knew a good thing when she saw him. Well, I think so. I hope so. I hope so. The poor thing. And then you had you had children yourself. Then. I had uh, two sons, and uh, I have a grandson, and I have a granddaughter now. And just throwing my mind back to those days and looking at your board now, I mean, what are the big changes for you in your head? Like, what's it like, you know, in comparison to when you knew well, Tremor first? Tr Tremor is still Tremor to me, except in that it's got so big, you know, the way it's branched out. But, the like, we only operated, like, Patrick Street was where we, everything animated from Patrick Street, all the fun, all the games, all everything. And and down around the main street, down the beach, 
they're all still the same really okay that the shops have changed and 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 people may have changed but the, but it's still the same tremore whereas all these houses up here like we don't really know anybody and i'm sure that's the same all over ireland all these small little towns have grown huge so that the people who were actually born bred there and, and lived there um or I suppose kind of like they feel isolated in that they, we, you know, we are in our own little cocoon. I go down to Tesco or I go anywhere like that and we meet, like Breathe a Whittle, all that. We've been friends since we were nine years of age and we've just grown up in that little cocoon, as I say. And we have a great crack together because we know each other from... From, from nine years of age all of us and we're all in our 70s and in, some of us in our 80s now you know and I'm sure that happens all over Ireland all over the world probably so. yeah <clears throat> and I mean so it's just I suppose the main change is the growth of the place really the growth yeah, yeah, yeah. the growth and uh, I just trying to think now what about just uh, Jerry, is there anything you want to ask, Terry? Because you know him very well. I've known Terry all of my life, but we weren't friends because he's way older than me. Okay. <laughs> it's <laughs> true. Well, I, I, knew, I knew her mother. Yeah. Is. I knew her mother. I knew my mother, my grandparents. Yes. Patrick Street was where they all lived. Okay. So, no, I didn't know. And, okay. and, uh, Geraldine's mother's house was the another Mecca. Because the centre of the universe. The centre of the universe. Can I ask Terry just one thing about the you know the down around the amusements and all that? Was there a sense of all of that thing that you know the the hurdy gurdies? The hurdy gurdies, right? yes. Was, was there a sense that uh, it was a different crowd to Tremor? Do you know what I mean? Like because some of those people would come in, like the fairground people would come in. Yeah, and um, they'd be here for the season and then they'd be gone. The Edens and the uh, my grandmother knew them, the McGorks, which I. Uh, there was a McGorks up in Peter Street they must have been relations to these people but they were never hurdy-gurdy people in my day but they must have because my grandmother used to mention them and the Edenses and all those they came they all went but the Dooleys have stayed you see so they're you could call the Dooleys from more people now because they're here since Tonky's years you know and these are the who are also the fish and chip shop, isn't Yes. It? Okay. Yeah. So it's quite interesting that they went into the fish and chips as yeah. well as the... Yeah, the, like, oh, they'd, be more, they'd be from more people now. I'd say, geez, I'd say Wilfie would be insulted if you said he was blowing. <laughs> I wouldn't say him as blowing. No, but I'm, but I'm just, I suppose what I'm getting at is that the, you know, these people came in and then there were, might be, there might be another place in a few weeks' time or, you know what I mean, they, they moved around. Yeah, they did, yeah. They did, and uh, sure, I think Bobby Edens went back. I think they were from the Cork area, and he went he went back there. And the Pipers, sure, they are to more people as well now, because I worked with them. George worked with me. They came in as the amusement people as well. And sure, Jackie Piper up there, sure, they're still still doing it. They live up there. And would you, you were a young fella in Tremor, would you, would you ever have any run-ins with Fels and Warford? No, I, and I'd say the reason no. Most of the fellas, and I still know them to this day, all came out during the summer and we played football on the strand. So I know loads of fellas in Waterford, they're all the same age as myself. But we were all friendly. We played football together on the beach and all that. They came out on the beach. So that we didn't go into town that much at all. Uh, except I went when I went to the tech, we went in and out on the train but that'd be only our only foray into town we would we'd stay out here so there was never any aggression around that or well i didn't experience any anyway i have to say never did and I, as i said i still know the lads from donkey's years and would you remember i mean obviously you do remember but the the tramor train and when it closed and all that kind of stuff. oh yeah and the, i remember the first day the um, diesel went on the, the line and I had a, a monthly ticket because I was going to the take. I got on the diesel train, I stayed on it all day. 
went in there. Wait, because it was so novel? Yeah, it was so novel. <laughs> Jeez, wasn't it? Oh, Lord. And was it faster than the, the steam? Oh, it was, yeah. There was no steam either. You weren't sitting down with smoke coming in the door. <laughs> Why, well, was the steam trains, were they a bit of a pain like that? Oh shit! Was choke, 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 choke. Hey, listen, me. I loved the train. I wasn't. I had never. But um, I mean, we we're talking like. I mean, they went out through the wall twice. Like, you know, <laughs> he didn't know whether it was going to stop or not. <laughs> you won't feel safe in the place. Oh gee! And there was a the 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 five minute bell. And uh, we used to come down past the street to go get on the train, nine o'clock train. We went to town. And there was poor Mr. Higgins. Do you remember him? Uh, yes, across the road. From Mr. And he used to come up with his briefcase and his Anthony Eden hat, you see. And he'd be walking down behind the scene. We'd all be walking for the train. And we used to get to the top of train hill. You see. <laughs> and we'd, we'd look like this, you see. And, and then we'd make the run, you see. <laughs> and we'd stop. And he'd come here and around the corner. And he thought the gates were closed. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh, dear. What I think of Silly ones. <laughs> Jeez. Oh, God almighty tonight. And then your man, poor old Johnny Corcoran, he used to do the five minute bell. He'd ring the bell. He'd see you at the top of the hill and he'd ring the bell, you see, five minutes. And he'd close the door. <laughs> oh, jeez. Oh, you know, things were, there was no such, things were easy in Ireland in those days. You just did what you liked. The train might go at nine o'clock, and it mightn't. Don't worry about time, you'll get there. Oh, God almighty, tonight. And how long did it take to get into town, though? Um, now, that, I, 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 I don't know. I suppose about quarter or 20 minutes. It was a great trip, now. Actually, I don't know why they don't use it as a walkway, because it goes all the way around the back there now, and it, it'd be terrific if they did it. They made a walkway there, like on that train. And uh, the diesel then, how long did that run before it stopped? I, I, I can't remember now, but they, they, they tried, they were, were oh, there was a big um, schmazzle over it and they wanted to get buses and they hired buses, which they didn't last long either. So eventually the buses came, which I must say the service, the bus service here is absolutely terrific. Now I have to say every half hour no one can complain and of course that meant people all the way into town can get a transport into Waterford now whereas before they couldn't you know you had to get, either get into tomorrow or get into Waterford to travel and uh, Terry what shops do you remember from you know, well, in Tremor that are no longer here now um, Lodges um, one of the Ray Hertridge or Hertridge's that was the hardware store and where the there's a bookie shop there and there was a charity shop that was where you, you got all the it was the supermarket kind of and there was a bakery there and we, my uncle used to work in the bakery and tom connor's bakery they used to work there in that shop that was lodges and then there was um martin's uh down in the main street which did everything from a needle to haystack, shoes, clothes, the whole lot. And uh, it was Dermot Cattle worked in there, and that's where Cattle's shop comes up. Because when they closed down, he, he opened up Cattle's. Even though it was Michael Clark, as it was still called Cattle's. So, and then there was um, Billy Stewart, was another shop. And um, there was a butcher shop, Feelings. And when Cunningham was opened first, there was a, a, a fellow, was a miser lived there. He used to be reading by the light of the, the street lamp. And he'd walk into town and he'd land all over Waterford, I think. But um, I think when they, when he eventually did die, I think he was two or three days dead before they, they found him. And I think they found loads of money on him and everything. I remember him well. I don't know what his name was. But he used to always be sit, standing outside the door under the street lamp reading the paper. <sighs> Such is life. And, and what about the popes? Because you mentioned the Vic and you mentioned the High B. What about the popes? Have they changed much over the years? 
Oh, well, should they have, haven't they, really? I mean, they're all modern. I mean, um, the Blue Lookout. No, I was never in the Blue Lookout because I wasn't kind of drinking at the time. But when I did, I always stayed down in the, in the Vic. Um, I wasn't a fan of Martha's. I used to have, and then I ended up in the Hybe. But I used to be another one was called... Um, Murray's, which is now gone, it's just above Morph's on the corner. I think it's a bed and uh, kind of a hostel now. Um, I used to go in there. That had the old stone floor and like that, you know. And then there was the halfway house, um, Katie Riley's. I went there once and I asked her to go to the toilet. He wouldn't sit out the door and I went out, it was a field. I was looking, I came back in and said, sorry, well, where's the toilet? said, you were out. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, everybody smoked in the pubs then. Sorry? People oh, smoked, the my God. Every September, I had to be in hospital. Um, after my stint in the summer season in the IV, because after the, in the bar closed or whatever hour, you had to sweep the floor because fags and everything like that and the dust to be gone and it was I with chronic asthma and I sweeping this floor with this big scrub so eventually I'd end up in hospital for about a week or so every September so I think it was a great thing when they did get rid of this the so and uh, is it true that you Just in, in relation to the the, uh, the back strand and all that, did you ever go down picking cockles on that? Yes. And, um, was that a Riverstown thing? I mean, like, was that associated with the people down there? Or? I know, I, 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 I went down, but now, of course, my grandmother would have warned me about down there, because there was quicksand, quicksand down there, and my uncle nearly, nearly drowned down there, he got caught in it, and... Um, because he was a devil for going down fishing and not going to work. So he got caught in the quicksand and only for these two visitors who were coming along the way, he was up to there. And they pulled him out. And there was another um, old lady who lived alongside us, Mrs. Murphy, and um, her children, Annie and that. And Annie's sister went down there and they never found her. She just went, never got any sign of her. So we were, um, my grandmother was always warning me about going down there, so I'd never tell her I was down there, you see. But I remember I went down once fishing. She said, did I fish? Went down with Frankie myself, and we set up all these hooks on a big length of a line way out in the back strand. And we, we waited all day for the tide to come in to collect all the fish. Naturally, we didn't collect any fish. But when I got home, I got belted. Jeez, my mother nearly went berserk. I didn't come home until about nine o'clock at night. She hadn't seen me since nine that morning. Holy God, her baby, gone. Jeez. So that was made of, we won an only fishing expedition. <laughs> it, it ended in abject failure. Oh, Lord. But yeah, we used, to, we used to play cowboys and Indians down there as well. But it was, I mean, there was a lot of people used to pick cockles down there. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And there were good cockles too, and still are. Really, they were the big ones, like, you know. And periwinkles then, across the, on the rocks, we used to pick those as well. So, we used to we'd go from the strand to the pier on the rocks, and we'd have a race, see so who'll get across go to the file first and then the file to the pier and then uh, in the on the file there was the steps up big stony steps but we never went that way we climbed up the cliff excuse oh, me so mother when you said the file what's the file it was um, there in the middle between the between the the cove the cove and the strand it's it comes up in the middle of the dawn rail i think that there's only a few of the steps left now but there was all steps down there huge but we climbed up the cliff. We didn't climb the steps. <sighs> Couldn't do it now. 
can't even climb the steps. <laughs> okay, Terry, thanks very much. For oh, that's that. all. Uh, that was great. That was brilliant. <coughs> and it was brilliant because you have to give me loads of things now that when I'm talking to other people, I have loads of subjects I can talk to them about. Well, I, I, yeah, I'm sure there's other people with much better stories than I have. No, your stories much, are uh, What have you, but um, the things you remember are funny, you yeah, know, they really are. Like I want to ask you something. Billy Stewart's shop, what yeah. was it? It was a, a, a shop like, um, you know, you got meat and ham and okay. like super value. He was my, uh, related to my father, Billy Stewart. Was he? I believe so, because Paul Cunningham yesterday, when I asked him if he'd do the film.